He is praised as one of the most significant literary figures of the modern age. In the 20th century, there aren't as many poets who can really command that ringing line that wants to just beat your heart for you. William Butler Yeats brought Irish literature to world renown. I think Yeats is one of the greatest poets since Shakespeare. I think as long as poetry is, is read and enjoyed, Yeats will be right there with the greatest. Yeats was much more than a poet. A playwright, politician, and visionary, Yeats was a man driven by deep passions for his country and for the woman he loved. Yeats is such a passionate poet, and that comes through in his poetry, in the way he writes about love and loneliness and the loss of love and the frustration of being in love. Um, he's the great poet of unrequited love. On January 30th, 1889, a tall, red-haired beauty knocked at the door of the Yates family home. Maud Gunn arrived to have dinner with the family and to meet 25-year-old William Butler Yates, who had just published his first book of poetry, a book filled with Irish mythology and Celtic mysticism. But his writings would soon turn to matters of the heart. As soon as Yates saw her, he fell in love with her. Um, and he later wrote that that was when the troubling of his life began. Their meeting sparked an obsession. Yeats would remain under Maud Gunn's spell for the next 25 years. Although they both came from the upper class, the two of them couldn't have been more different. Yeats was an intellectual and a poet, dreamy, sickly, and shy. He preferred reading books to fighting political battles. On the other hand, Maud Gunn was a political rabble-rouser. Maud Gunn, by temperament, was a person who was always likely to be drawn into active political life in some form or another. Yeats romanticized Maud Gunn. She embodied his ideal of the perfect woman, beautiful and dangerous. Wherever she went, she caused a stir. She would step into a room and all eyes would be drawn to her. Yates proposed marriage more than once, but Maud Gunn repeatedly turned him down. He didn't give up and wooed her with poetry, bearing his heart and creating some of the most enduring love poems of modern literature. Poems like He Wishes for the Cloths of Heaven. Had I the heavens embroidered cloths, Enwrought with golden and silver light, The blue and the dim and the dark glows Of night and light and the half-light, I would spread the cloths under your feet. But I, being poor, have only my dreams. I have spread my dreams under your feet. Tread softly, because you tread on my dreams. His poems are so personally powerful. He gives you the emotion of what it's like to feel rejection, remorse, and ecstasy as well. While Maud was cool to the idea of Yeats as a husband, she encouraged him to channel his passions into his literary ambitions. There's probably some truth in what she said many years later, that if she had accepted his hand in marriage, he would not have written all those beautiful love poems poems that are so redolent of unconsummated desire. Maud Gunn believed Yeats's poetry and the creation of an Irish literary voice would do more for Ireland's independence than her political involvements. After centuries of subjugation by the British, the Irish were hungry for self-rule. Both Yeats and Gunn were passionately committed to Ireland's liberation, but in different ways. Some, like Maud Gunn, wanted a completely independent Ireland and were willing to fight for that. Yeats believed in the power of literature to build an Irish identity and inspire a peaceful transition to independence. He would be a poet who would give voice to the aspirations of his countrymen and countrywomen and therefore he began to think about the importance of his poetry 
as a national voice embodying the spirit of the nation, if you will. You know, he, he's actually taking on the role of, of national bard. Yeats created poetry that celebrated Ireland's ancient myths and symbols, but in a way that avoided the tired cliches of earlier poets. He said, we have to get rid of shamrocks, we have to get rid of pepper pots, we have to get rid of um, wolf hounds and round towers. All the iconography of 19th century nationalism, it had served its turn. And we now have to find a new language and a new set of icons. Yeats hoped to bring people together and unify the country through a shared love of poetry, drama, and the visual arts. But Yeats knew there was a stumbling block to getting his poetry to the people. Most of the Irish were poor and uneducated. He realized that if he was going to have an impact, that he had to make his work available to people who couldn't read. And so one of his major impulses was to revive the old oral tradition in Ireland and um, to make his poetry accessible to the ear. Because if many people in Ireland couldn't read, they could certainly listen. And he felt that they were great listeners. Yeats wrote poems to be chanted out loud in the tradition of the ancient Celtic bards. Among the new icons that Yeats celebrated was the very landscape of Ireland. His most famous poem, The Lake Isle of Inishfree, evokes his longing for the rural byways of County Sligo, where he spent his childhood summers. In 1932, Yeats chanted the poem for the BBC. I will arise and go now, and go to Innes free, and a small cabin build there of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows will I have there, a hive for the honey bee, and live alone in the bee cloud glade. It's an exile's yearning for a home. Yeats writes in his autobiography of how living in London, which Yeats never enjoyed living in, um, they would yearn for Sligo so much that they just wanted a piece of turf from Sligo to hold on to. I will arise and go now, for always night and day, I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore, while I stand on the roadway or on the pavement's grey, I hear it in the deep heart's core. I love the three last lines of that poem, which, it's, which are impossible to say fast. Deep heart's core. It's about as peaceful and still a line as there can be. But poetry alone was not popular enough to accomplish all of Yeats's goals. Under Maud Gunn's influence, Yeats became more political. He wanted to engage more directly with his fellow Irishmen and felt that drama, not poetry, would be the best way to do it. At that time, Ireland didn't have a national theatre. Eight centuries of British dominance had all but silenced the voice of Irish culture. With a friend and supporter, Lady Augusta Gregory, Yeats set out to fill this cultural void and founded the Abbey Theatre, the first national theatre of Ireland. Night after night at the Abbey, dramas by Yeats, Lady Gregory, and other Irish playwrights unfolded, bringing to life their vision of a unified Ireland through literature. It was here that Yeats's most celebrated political play, Kathleen Nehoulihan, opened in 1902 to sold-out crowds and critical acclaim. Kathleen Nehoulihan is the traditional figure of Ireland. It's imagining Ireland as the poor old woman, a woman who has got too many strangers in the house, by which she means there are too many strangers in her country. On the other hand, uh, Kathleen Houlihan has the potential for being uh, a beautiful young queen. The fiery leading lady was none other than Maud Gunn. 
So this tall statuesque figure dressed up in these old widow's clothes and at the end when she unveils herself and stands up to her full height and uh, you see her beauty it had a very great impact on the theatre audience. People felt that this was a very um, eloquent and moving testament to the power of patriotism and yet some people felt that so patriotic was it that it was almost dangerous. While the play was inflaming nationalist feelings, Yeats was basking in its triumph. He was on top of the world. But less than a year later, he was in the depths of despair. The love of his life, Maud Gunn, had just married another man. He goes through a very interesting period in, in 1903 when he learns that Maud Gunn has married John McBride. It has such a tremendous impact on his art that he plummets like a plane from the heavens from the visionary down to the real world and from 1903 until 1917 he writes no visionary poems. John McBride was everything Yeats was not. A major in the military and an Irish nationalist, McBride was willing to take up arms to fight for independence. In April 1916, against popular opinion, a small band of Irish nationalists took over the Dublin post office and launched what became known as the Easter Rising. By the end of the week, the British military had suppressed the uprising. Dublin lay in ruins, and the instigators of the revolt were thrown in prison. Had that been the end of it, things might have returned to normal. Most Irish thought that the attempted overthrow had done more harm than good. People were stunned, and people felt that these people were extremists who would stop at nothing to prove a point. They really felt these people were rocking the boat. But British firing squads turned the hapless rebels into heroes. Fifteen were executed, including Maud Gunn's husband, John McBride. After the British executed the leaders, opinion began slowly but surely to change. People began to have more sympathy with the rebellion and all it represented. Yeats memorialized the event and his mixed feelings about it in a poem entitled Easter 1916, which concludes with a haunting refrain. Was it needless death after all? For England may keep faith. For all that is done and said, we know their dream. Enough to know they dreamed and are dead. And what if excessive love bewildered them till they died? I write it out in a verse. McDonough and McBride and Connolly and Pierce, now and in time to be, wherever green is worn, are changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. That oxymoronic, terrible beauty, which doesn't make any sense. Beauty shouldn't be terrible. And yet it makes perfect sense, and we all know exactly what he's talking about, when beauty is made out of something so horrible as these people being killed. It is considered one of the finest political poems of the 20th century. Why? Because on the one hand it commemorates the heroism of the rebellion, but on the other hand, it counts the cost in human terms. The death of John McBride left Maud Gunn free to remarry. 25 years had not diminished Yeats's love for her, and now, at age 52, he proposed once more. Again, and for the last time, she turned him down. Yeats finally accepted the fact that he and Maud would never marry, though they would remain friends until the end of his life. But Yeats then proposed to Maud Gunn's 22-year-old daughter Isolt, with whom he had been friends for many years. She also refused. Both of the Gunns, very wisely, were consistent in their refusal. <laughs> he finally turned to a young friend and kindred spirit, Georgie Hyde Lees. Even though Yeats was 25 years older, she immediately accepted. It almost seemed like an afterthought, you know. I couldn't get the one I wanted, so here's 
you know, number three. He really was.